Hi, I'm Karen Carniel, Deputy Editor at Cell, and we're here at the 79th Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Symposium on Quantitative Biology. This year's topic is cognition, and I'm very pleased to be here with Dr. Carl Svoboda, who is at uh, the Genelia Farm of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Thanks for joining me here. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. <laughs> so Carl, one of the many things you're interested in is understanding the neural coding that underlies object recognition right. and decision making. And one of the ways that you've chosen to investigate that is um, t tasks with, with rodents uh, using their whiskers to right. perceive. So can you tell us a little bit about that system and what you're learning? Yeah, so, 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 so mice, very prominently, other rodents to use their whiskers to explore the environment. And um, seems like a weird, system to study as opposed to say vision or touch through the paws but it turns out to have some wonderful advantages and wonderful features for kind of detailed mechanistic analysis of basic cognitive processes like active sensation perception decision making and, and one of the key uh, features is that the system is exquisitely mapped all the way into the cortex there's a kind of a one-to-one -one correspondence between individual whiskers and small groups of neurons that process information from that whisker. And if we can have the mouse do uh, behavior through individual whiskers, we know exactly where to look for the relevant information. So we can zoom in to the relevant neurons. We can manipulate, record and manipulate the relevant neurons, ask how manipulations have an impact on behavior and be very quantitative about that. Um, you know, in general, in many other systems, so that kind of thing is a needle in the haystack problem, mm -hmm. right? There are, it's very distributed. Here we know where to look. So is it kind of like in, in the case of the whiskers and the barrel cortex, that it, it's an instance of deterministic label lines as opposed to the kind of uh, distributed meaning imposed by experience, cortical neural representations e that others have described? Well, I think, I think it's both. Uh, these are, so, so that's a good point. I didn't mean to say that it's completely uh, innately specified, the map is likely, but there's a lot of experience dependent plasticity. And in fact, the barrel system first uh, had, its, had its heyday through studies in plasticity, right? But um, nevertheless, as the animal develops normally, the information processing happens uh, is sort of restricted to individual barrels. Mm -hmm. And um, there are a lot of features in the response of individual neurons to the dynamics of individual whiskers that are learned. There's direction selective, different neurons show different rates of adaptation and so on and so forth. There's a, there's a richness that, uh, that that's where the experience of plasticity comes in. But one can really, uh, we can have a sort of a comprehensive understanding of what the neural population is doing that processes information from, from, from one whisker. And, and so what's the route from understanding the somatosensory perception to a decision-making process in that system? The way we interact with the world, right, is by we sweep our eyes over objects, over visual scenes to uh, basically extract the information that we'd like, right? In some sense, we, through visual search or through our digits, moving our digits, we actually produce input to the visual system. You probably know that the visual system is never studied that way because it's a very difficult thing to keep track of what exactly the monkey or the mouse looked at, right? So here in this system, we can study uh, 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 decision making in the barrel cortex uh, in the context of active sensation where the mouse moves its whisker to explore an object, to touch it, to palpate it, to learn about its location or its shape and so on and so forth, and then uh, judge object location um, in various ways. So we can study decision making in the context of active sensation. And so the kinds of questions you can ask is what is encoded in the barrel cortex, right? So you can ask about neural coding. What, uh, so, so as you know, information is carried by action potentials in the barrel cortex, spikes uh, in neurons, and you can ask questions about how action potentials, trains of action potentials, different neurons or trains of action potentials, different neurons encode information about where the whisker is, what the whisker touches, how the whisker is touched, how it is deformed. And 
um, then you can go one step further and actually manipulate the activity to ask not only what is encoded, but what the rest of the brain reads out from that activity, which is sort of the, the kinds of things that you can do here that's very difficult to do in other, in other systems. That's why I think it really has a very, very nice niche. And what are this. some of the techniques that you've developed to probe this last manipulation and read out part that you described? Right, so we, we like, uh, we, we of course use electrophysiology extensively to learn what is encoded in the brain, so what kind of uh, what kind of tactile features, neurons, different kinds, specific types of neurons in the barrel cortex. Remember, the barrel cortex is still a complex, each barrel is still a complex structure, about 10,000 neurons, at least 20 cell types, and so on, just to, so that everyone understands that. But so we can ask uh, what is encoded in specific neurons using electrophysiology, and then uh, closed-loop behavior and photostimulation using optogenetics, we can then perturb uh, these action potential trains in a very precise manner to uh, see if we can push perception one way or another. And that is really the arbiter of truth, right, about what, uh, what actually is, is, is extracted by the animal from these action potential trains mm -hmm. about the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the, the, the action potentials lead me to sort of my next question, which is another thing you've been looking at is individual synapses, uh, yeah. their plasticity and right. their, their stability. So right. can you tell us a little about that? Well, to tell you the truth, this is something that has been very much on the wane in the laboratory. Even though we've published a paper this year, that was pro that experiment was probably done five or six years ago. So we've, we've but uh, the experiments that you refer to really go back to my work at Cold Spring Harbor uh, in the, in the uh, starting in the late, uh, 1900s, <laughs> uh, and uh, where uh, this is one of the first experiments I did when I started my lab here was looking for an important problem to address, and, and I was very much, um, um, uh, in, you know, we we set up some very powerful microscopes that allow us to look at individual synapses in the intact brain, and one of the things that had always puzzled me there was always this this classic literature about. Um, about uh, uh, ex enrichment uh, related plasticity, structural plasticity of neurons. And then at the other, on the other hand, we know that memories last for a long time. And so I thought it was very important to uh, study how stable neurons are, how stable synapses are, what is the lifetime of synapses, or different types of synapses. And that's how we got to study structural plasticity in the uh, uh, adult brain and its relationship to uh, experiential manipulations. And what we found basically is that a uh, substantial fraction of synapses, at least under the under non pathological conditions, are remarkably stable and they last for, can last for many months, in some cases for the uh, lifetime of an animal, which is something that I find quite surprising because they are made up of small numbers of fragile uh, uh, labile proteins. Still a mystery how that happens. But then uh, another fraction of uh, synapses turn over. They appear and disappear. And uh, that is modulated by experience. And it's also cell type specific. It, it happens at different rates, different synapses, thalamocortical synapses. Input to the cortex tend to be more stable than intracortical synapses and so on and so forth. And, and really this study of structural plasticity and these cell type specific effects really got me very much interested in uh, circuits, um, really cortical circuits, how do they work? Um, because we could not put this into a functional context uh, without uh, really knowing more about how neurons are hooked up and what the logic of information processing is in cortical circuits. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. see the field of Neural circuits and synaptic molecular biology uh, converging at some That's point. That's a good, in the good. Future. It's a really good point. I, I, I absolutely do, and I have, I have sort of a vision of coming back to it, right? So we have, uh, I've, I've dabbled in, in, in studying learning, in, uh, uh, at the level of circuits and coding. And I've learned this is a very, very difficult, difficult endeavor. So we've sort of stepped back and, and study what I would call function. Uh, I want to go back and learn and, and, and develop 
good learning paradigms, for example, good motor learning paradigms, and then go in and dissect, look for really the engram at the level of uh, uh, defined synaptic pathways, right? We, and we need to go there too beyond observation, right? Where we see a correlate of some synaptic change in a particular synaptic pathway, we have to really be able to show that those pathways and these changes at synapses are causally related to a memory, which is something that um, hopefully we'll get a handle on using molecular methods so over the next decade or so. And that's when I'm ready to go back to it. Yeah. Well, I'm certainly uh, excited to, uh, to, to see the advent of uh, all those advances and, and those that will come in the meantime, too. Thanks so much. Okay.